million tonnes of coal were mined in the United Kingdom. The price. The death of 344 men and boys at the Pretoria... In 1910, over 24 million tonnes of coal were mined in the United Kingdom. The price. The death of 344 men and boys at the Pretoria pit near Bolton. At the time, Britain's second biggest mining disaster. On the 21st of December 1910, Christmas festivities were forgotten. It became known as Black Christmas. Nearly every household in the town of West Orton near Bolton was affected. Some households lost every male member, father, son, brother and uncle. This is the story of the Pretoria Pit disaster. Britain's greatness in the 19th century was based on a plentiful supply of coal. Many regions in Britain practically owed their entire existence to the presence of coal. One of these was the town of West Orton, just west of Bolton. Its population rose from 4,547 in 1851 to 12,900 in 1901. In 1921, over half the resident males were miners. The mining of coal has always exacted a heavy price in miners' lives. Technology has continually tried to catch up to the reality of mining. It's technology chasing safety to make the mines safer. And they're safer now than they've ever, ever, ever been. Uh, but obviously, in the early days, they weren't very safe. I mean, at one bit, to get rid of gas, they used to have a blow, he used to douse himself in water with sacks over his back and crawl in with a lighted taper. We will look at individual stories of tragedy and heroism. We will look at the evidence provided by the official inquiry and what effect, if any, the disaster had on the future of mining safety and legislation. First, we will look at the history of coal mining in Britain to put the Pretoria pit into its historical context. Then we will look more specifically at the Pretoria disaster. Coal was first extracted from outcrops, where coal seams ran very close to the surface. Adits, or drifts, were driven into the outcrops, and small areas of coal would be worked out. These workings would eventually become flooded, or a build-up of gas known as fire damp, which was principally methane, or CH4, would occur. Well, fire damp is, uh, is a gas that... Uh, is inherent in the coal, it, because it's vegetable, it's wood and vegetation that's rotted down and being compressed. To get, or the gas is, is allowed out of it when it's crushed and smashed. When coal became more inaccessible near the surface, shallow shafts would be sunk, known as bell pits, because of their shape, from which the coal, in a small radius of the shaft, could be mined and then the shaft allowed to fall in. They went from that to ladder pit. These were sunk to the depth of 70 to 120 feet. The usual cost of the shaft was 50 to 100 pounds. And these were workmen, men could go down ladders in this basis and get to the bottom and work the coal down below. This was better organized. <coughs> coal was got and packed into corves, which were uh, baskets, circular baskets, placed on wooden sledge, uh, sleds and dragged to the shaft's bottom. A horse gin was usually used to wind the coal to the surface. Again, no artificial ventilation was attempted. With increasing demand for coal, particularly during the Industrial Revolution, shafts of greater depth were sunk. And one of the main problems with deep mining was flooding. The Newcomen atmospheric engine was introduced in 1712 to pump water from the workings. James Watt's steam engine, invented in 1769, enable miners to work seams of greater depth, while steam power was applied not only to pumping water, but to winding, haulage and ventilation in the mines. Yeah, where we're going now, we're, we're, pass, we're going to pass three coal seams, right, the flopped and thin, flopped and thick and old hard seam. The one we're going to, which is at a depth of 460 feet, it's called the new hard seam. This shaft was sunk to that level in 1876. It's probably 
one of the oldest working mining sites in Europe. This. At that, at that time, the colliery was owned by a young lady, Emma Listerke. She inherited the business from her father, John Listerke. And so you're actually going to go back. We're passing points that have been mined over 200 years ago. But what they would do is sink the shaft to a level, work the coal seam yeah. as far as they could naturally with natural ventilation, come out of there and then sink the shaft deeper. But you get to a certain point where winding coal up and down shaft takes a certain length of time. Also, it's very expensive to sink shafts. So when we get to a certain level, we then drive roadways which slope down underground. We call them cross-measure drifts. You go down to coal seams further. So where we're going is the fourth coal seam that's been worked. There has been three below that what have been worked out as well. As mining coal went further underground, the room and pillar system was adopted. Where surface support was needed, pillars of coal of the required size were left. Where no surface support was needed, pillars were wholly or partially extracted. It is also known as pillar and stall. A pillar and stall system. At the front is a man, he's called a hewer. He's actually swinging a pick to dig coal out. What he does, picks that coal off that coal face and he pushes it, lifts it or shovels it into that wooden box called a core. He's the strongest member of the family team. He's working semi-naked, usually they would be naked as well. We would be at about the limit of natural ventilation. We don't have fans to ventilate pits at this stage, early 1800s. When he's put the coal in that wooden box, the coal, the next strongest member of the family, be his wife or his daughter, the small teenagers, kids down to probably six, eight years old, their job's called a hurrier. The hurrier drags that box along this road where they would normally do it in the dark can't afford a candle, right? We've got to work six days a week, 12, 13 hours a day, just to survive, bare minimum, next door to starvation. Everything that they earn, they basically give back to the owner of the mine because the candles that they use, the tools they use, the clothes they wear, the food they buy, the house they live in, all belong to the mine owners. They're actually next door to being slaves. And in, in fact, there are instances where people who were prosecuted for leaving one colony and trying to get a job at another without asking if they could change jobs. So you have a family. Then 1842, the Act took women and children under 10 out of mines. All that bloke then had lost two thirds of his workforce and he'd have to pay. And we've got the chap there, a young child, five, six years old, Pull them out of bed on a morning at four o'clock, bring them to a place like this and leave them in the dark. Yeah, on pillar and stall workings, and one at colliers that uh, have been underground, they were pillar and stall workings, but they were under the North Sea. Um, in fact, they went seven miles under the North Sea. And uh, if you could have, they worked pillar and stall, and if you could have taken the roof off them, you would look down and see it looked just like a draft board. A 10 yard pillar of coal left, a 10 yard taken out, 10 yard left, 10 yard taken out. The room and pillar method of extracting coal was eventually superseded by the long wall method. And as its name implies, this consisted of working at a long face of the seam and extracting all the available coal. At each coal face, you have a coal seam. You've got to get Supplies, men and ventilation up so you have two roadways, one at either end of a coal face. As you take the coal out, the coal face advances so you extend those roadways behind it. The distance between one roadway and the next, the length of the coal face, can be between 100 and 300 metres. When you've taken the coal out, you do not want a big open space behind you. Because if you leave it supported, gas accumulates in there. Plus, it short circuits the air. You need the air up to the coal face where the men are actually working. So we use a total caving system. We advance the supports constantly. And we purposely let the roof collapse behind us. A total caving system. You need that void to be filled with the roof debris as it comes down. Pretoria Pit used the long wall method. And by the time it was in production, two faces of one seam used mechanical coal cutting and an electrically driven haulage system the endless rope. This is the endless rope. 
the first thing would attach tubs of coal or supplies would be to take a, a long lashing chain with a hook at either end. While this rope was running, they take the chain like that. Learned to do this as a 16 year old boy. They take the chain and throw it round the rope, catch it, bring it over like that. And then what they do then is drop that chain into there. That grips like a vice. That'll pull 30 tonne of coal. The only problem is if you take your eyes off the ball, the fingers end up in there. Pretoria was the local name for the Holton Numbers 3 and 4 bank pits. The whole colliery complex was called the Holton Colliery Company and was situated on the Holton Park Estate on the border of Atherton and West Orton, near Bolton. The company employed 2,400 people, 889 of whom worked at Pretoria. The company raised 2,400 tonnes of coal per day roughly one tonne of coal per worker per day. The site of the shafts can still be seen today. The two shafts of the Pretoria pit, numbers three and four, were sunk between 1900 and 1901. They were 18 feet in diameter and 75 yards apart. Number three shaft was the upcast and number four was the downcast. To explain the difference between upcast and downcast, the Fowler shaft was the upcast shaft, and the principle of this was down the metal framework, open framework, fans drew fresh air down into the pit workings. These were pumped through the system using brattices, which was like a tarred sack coloured cloth on frames to direct the fresh air into the various areas of the mine. At the other, at the other end of the pit of the upcast shaft, which was boarded in to create a chimney effect, uh, fans drew the mine, the contaminated gas and air, out of the mine, pumped it up the shaft, because that shaft now created a, a chimney situation where the, all the waste was pumped to atmosphere above ground level so that nobody got gas or anything like that. And that's the difference between the upcast and a downcast. If you look at them, the, the foul air one is boarded to create a chimney effect. Ventilation in the Pretoria pit was provided by electrically driven fans of the Sirocco type one beam placed in each of the four mines underground to circulate air and ventilate the workings. On the surface, near to number three shaft, was a huge Sirocco fan, some eight and a half feet in diameter, which was used at weekends when the underground fans were stopped to allow maintenance work. There are 17 seams of coal in this area of Lancashire. The Pretoria pit mined five of these. From nearest the surface downwards, these are 146 yards down, the trencher bone, 3 foot 6 inch thick. 274 yards down, the plodder, 2 foot thick. 306 yards down, the yard, 3 foot 11 inches thick. 361 yards down, the 3 quarters, 1 foot 5 inch thick. And 434 yards down, the arley, 2 foot 11 inches thick. The general dip of the seams was an average of 1 in 5.5 to the south. Three seams were worked from one level. The plodder, the three quarters and the yard seams. The yard mine had five main working levels. The north plodder, the three quarters, the top yard or up brow, the bottom yard, down brow and the south plodder. The workings were very extensive, the north plodder being the furthest at over a mile from the shaft bottom. Mechanical coal cutting and repairs operated from 10.30pm until 6.30am. The coal getting shift descended at 6.45am and was wound up at 2.45pm. Christmas was only four days away at the time of the disaster. Pretoria was considered to be one of the most modern and safest collieries in the area and despite there being evidence of gas in the mine, no one could have foreseen the extent of the disaster. Gas occurs in large quantities in nearly all bituminous coal. The mixture of gases found in mines is known as fire damp and it's a product of the decay of vegetable matter from which uh, the coal seams themselves were formed. Uh, well, fire damp, right, it, it's only explosive within a certain range in atmosphere you're breathing at the moment. It's explosive between 5 and 15%. Anywhere within that range, if you introduce a, a naked flame or a spark, that's hot enough, it will explode. There's never a second chance, it always explodes. That's not the end of it. 
because that explosion lifts coal dust in the air and believe it or not coal dust actually explodes as well so it propagates yet a bigger bang and it'll go on and on until it